Chapter One of Mount Royal, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mount Royal, Volume One by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Chapter One The Days That Are No More. And he was a widower, said Christabel. She was listening to an oft told tale, kneeling in the firelight at her aunt's knee the ruddy glow tenderly touching her fair soft hair and fairer forehead her big blue eyes lifting lovingly to mrs tregonell's face and he was a widower aunt diana she repeated with an expression of distaste as if something had set her teeth on edge i cannot help wondering why you would care for a widower a man who had begun life by caring for somebody else do you suppose any one desperately in love ever thinks of the past asked another voice out of the twilight those infatuated creatures called lovers are too happy and contented with the rapture of the present one would think you had tremendous experience jessie by the way you lay down the law said christabel laughing but i want to know what auntie has to say about falling in love with a widower if you had ever seen him and known him i don't think you would wonder at my liking him answered mrs tregonell lying back in her armchair and talking of the story of her life in a placid way as if it were the plot of a novel so thoroughly does time smooth the rough edge of grief when he came to my father's house his young wife had been dead just two years she died three days after the birth of her first child and captain hemley was very sad and grave and seemed to take very little pleasure in life it was in the shooting season and the other men were out upon the hills all day murdering innocent birds interjected christabel how i hate them for it captain hemley hung about the house not seeming to know very well what to do with himself so your mother and i took pity upon him and tried to amuse him which effort resulted in his amusing us for he was ever so much cleverer than we were he was so kind and sympathetic we had just founded a dorcas society and we were muddling hopelessly in an endeavour to make good sensible rules so that we should do nothing to lessen the independent feeling of our people and he came to our rescue and took the whole thing in hand and seemed to understand it all as thoroughly as if he had been establishing dorcas societies all his life my father said it was because the captain had been sixth wrangler and that it was the higher mathematics which made him so clever at making rules but clare and i said it was his kind heart that made him so quick at understanding how to help the poor without humiliating them it was very nice of him said christabel who had heard the story a hundred times before but who was never weary of it and had a special reason for being interested this afternoon and so he stayed a long time at my grandfather's and you fell in love with him i began by being sorry for him replied mrs tregonell he told us all about his young wife how happy they had been how their one year of wedded life seemed to him like a lovely dream they had only been engaged three months he had known her less than a year and a half altogether had come home from india had seen her at a friend's house fallen in love with her married her and lost her within those eighteen months everybody smiled upon us he said i ought to have remembered polycrates and his ring he must have been rather a doleful person said christabel who had all the exacting ideas of early youth in relation to love and lovers a widower of that kind ought to perform sottie and make an end of the business rather than go about the world prosing to nice girls i wonder more and more that you could have cared for him and then seeing her aunt's eyes shining with unshed tears the girl laid her sunny head upon the matronly shoulder and murmured tenderly forgive me for teasing you dear i am only pretending i love to hear about captain hemley and i am not very much surprised that you ended by loving him or that he soon forgot his brief dream of bliss with the other young lady and fell desperately in love with you it was not till after christmas that we were engaged continued mrs tregonell looking dreamily at the fire my father was delighted so was my sister clara your dear mother everything went pleasantly our lives seemed all sunshine i ought to have remembered polycrates for i knew schiller's ballad about him by heart but i could think of nothing beyond that perfect all-sufficing happiness we were not to be married till late in the autumn when it would be three years since his wife's death it was my father's wish that i should not be married till after my nineteenth birthday which would not be till september i was so happy in my engagement 
so confident in my lover's fidelity that i was more than content to wait so all that spring he stayed at penlee our mild climate had improved his health which was not good at all when he came to us indeed he had retired from the service before his marriage chiefly on account of weak health but he spoke so lightly and confidently about himself in this matter that it never entered into my head to feel any serious alarm about him till early in may when he and claire and i were caught in a drenching rainstorm during a mountaineering expedition on rough tor and then had to walk four or five miles in the rain before we came to the inn where the carriage was to wait for us clara and i who were always about in all weathers were very little worse for the wet walk and the long drive home in damp clothes but george was seriously ill for three weeks with cough and low fever and it was at this time that our family doctor told my father that he would not give much for his future son-in-law's life there was a marked tendency to lung complaint he said captain hamley had confessed that several members of his family had died of consumption my father told me this urged me to avoid a marriage which must end in misery to me and was deeply grieved when i declared that no such consideration would induce me to break my engagement and to grieve the man i loved if it were needful that our marriage should be delayed i was contented to submit to any delay but nothing could loosen the tie between me and my dear love aunt and niece were both crying now however familiar the story might be they always wept a little at this point george never knew one word of this conversation between my father and me he never suspected our fears but from that hour my happiness was gone my life was one perpetual dread one ceaseless struggle to hide all anxieties and fears under a smile george rallied and seemed to grow strong again was full of energy and high spirits and i had to pretend to think him as thoroughly recovered as he fancied himself but by this time i had grown sadly wise i had questioned our doctor had looked into medical books and i knew every sad sign and token of decay i knew what the flushed cheek and the brilliant eye the damp cold hand and the short cough meant i knew that the hand of death was on him whom i loved more than all the world besides there was no need for the postponement of our marriage in the long bright days of august he seemed wonderfully well as well as he had been before the attack in may i was almost happy for in spite of what the doctor had told me i began to hope but early in september while the dressmakers were in the house making my wedding clothes the end came suddenly unexpectedly with only a few hours warning oh christabel i cannot speak of that day no darling you shall not you must not cried christabel showering kisses on her aunt's pale cheek and yet you always lead her on to talk about captain hamley said the sensible voice out of the shadow isn't that just a little inconsistent of our sweet bell don't call me your sweet bell as if i were a baby exclaimed the girl i know i am inconsistent i was born foolish and no one has ever taken the trouble to cure me of my folly and now auntie dear tell me about captain hamley's son the boy who is coming here to-morrow i have not seen him since he was at eton the squire drove me down on a fourth of june to see him it was very good of uncle tregonell the squire was always good replied mrs tregonell with a dignified air christabel's only remembrance of her uncle was of a large loud man who blustered and scolded a good deal and frequently contrived perhaps without meaning it to make everybody in the house uncomfortable so she reflected inwardly upon that blessed dispensation which however poorly wives may think of living husbands provides that every widow should consider her departed spouse completely admirable and was he a nice boy in those days asked christabel keenly interested he was a handsome gentleman-like lad very intellectual looking but i was grieved to see that he looked delicate like his father and his dame told me that he generally had a winter cough who took care of him in those days his maternal aunt a baronet's wife with a handsome house in eaton square all his mother's people were well placed in life poor boy hard to have neither father nor mother it was twelve years ago when you spent that season in london with the squire said christabel calculating profoundly with the aid of her finger-tips and angus hamley was then sixteen which makes him now eight-and-twenty dreadfully old and since then he has been at oxford and he got the newdigate what is the newdigate and he did not hunt or drive tandem or have rats in his rooms 
or paint the doors vermilion like like the general run of young men said christabel reddening and hurrying on confusedly and he was altogether rather a superior person at the university he had not your cousin leonard's high spirits and powerful physique said mrs tregonell as if she were ever so slightly offended young men's tastes are so different yes sighed christabel it's lucky they are is it not it wouldn't do for them all to keep rats in their rooms would it the poor old colleges would smell so dreadful well with another sigh it is just three weeks since angus hamley accepted your invitation to come here to stay and i have been expiring of curiosity ever since if he keeps me expiring much longer i shall be dead before he comes and i have a dreadful foreboding that when he does appear i shall detest him no fear of that said miss bridgman the owner of the voice that issued now and again from the covert of a deep armchair on the other side of the fireplace why not mistress oracle asked christabel because as mr hamley is accomplished and good-looking and as you see very few young men of any kind and none that are particularly attractive the odds are fifty to one that you will fall in love with him i am not that kind of person protested christabel drawing up her long full throat a perfect throat and one of the girl's chief beauties i hope not said mrs tregonell i trust that bell has better sense than to fall in love with a young man just because he happens to come to stay in the house christabel was on the point of exclaiming why auntie you did it but caught herself up sharply and cried out instead with an air of settling the question for ever my dear jessie he is eight-and-twenty just ten years older than i am of course he's ever so much too old for her a blasé man of the world said mrs tregonell i should be deeply sorry to see my darling marry a man of that age and with such antecedents i should like her to marry a young man not above two or three years her senior and fond of rats said jessie bridgman to herself for she had a shrewd idea that she knew the young man whose image filled mrs tregonell's mind as she spoke all these words were spoken in a goodly oak-panelled room in the manor-house known as mount royal on the slope of a bosky hill about a mile and a half from the little town of Bocastle, on the north coast of cornwall it was an easy matter according to the herald's office to show that mount royal had belonged to the tregonells in the days of the norman kings for the tregonells traced their descent by a female branch from the ancient baronial family of botterell or botreau who once held a kind of court in their castle on mount royal had their dungeons and their prisoners and in the words of carew exercised some large jurisdiction of the ancient castle hardly a stone remained but the house in which mrs tregonell lived was as old as the reign of james i and had all the rich and quaint beauty of that delightful period in architecture nor was there any prettier room at mount royal than this spacious oak-panelled parlour with curious nooks and cupboards a recessed fireplace or cosy corner with a small window on each side of the chimney-breast and one particular alcove placed at an angle of the house overlooking one of the most glorious views in england it might be hyperbole perhaps to call those cornish hills mountains yet assuredly it was a mountain landscape over which the eye roved as it looked from the windows of mount royal for those wide sweeps of hillside those deep clefts and gorges and heathery slopes on which the dark red cattle grazed in silent peacefulness and the rocky bed of the narrow river that went rushing through the deep valley had all the grandeur of the scottish highlands all the pastoral beauty of switzerland and away to the right beyond the wild and indented coastline that horned coast which is said to give its name to cornwall cornu wales stretched the atlantic the room had that quaint charm peculiar to rooms occupied by many generations and upon which each age as it went by has left its mark it was a room full of anachronisms there was some of the good old jacobean furniture left in it while spindle-legged chippendale tables and luxurious nineteenth-century chairs and sofas agreeably contrasted with those heavy oak cabinets and corner cupboards here an old indian screen or a china monster suggested a fashionable auction room filled with ladies who wore patches and played ombre and squabbled for ideal ugliness in oriental pottery there a delicately carved cherry wood prie-dieu with claw feet recalled the earlier beauties of the stuart court 
time had faded the stamped velvet curtains to that neutral withered leaf hue which painters love in a background and against which bright yellow chrysanthemums and white asters in dark red and blue japanese bowls seen dimly in the fitful fire glow made patches of light and colour the girl kneeling by the matron's chair looking dreamily into the fire was even fairer than her surroundings she was thoroughly english in her beauty features not altogether perfect but complexion of that dazzling fairness and wild rose bloom which is in itself enough for loveliness a complexion so delicate as to betray every feeling of the sensitive mind and to vary with every shade of emotion her eyes were blue clear as summer skies and with an expression of childlike innocence that look which tells of a soul whose purity has never been tarnished by the knowledge of evil that frank clear outlook was natural in a girl brought up as christabel courtenay had been at a good woman's knee shut in and sheltered from the rough world reared in the love and fear of god shaping every thought of her life by the teaching of the gospel she had been an orphan at nine years old and had parted for ever from mother and father before her fifth birthday mrs courtenay leaving her only child in her sister's care and going out to india to join her husband one of the sutter judges husband and wife died of cholera in the fourth year of mrs courtenay's residence at calcutta leaving christabel in her aunt's care mr courtenay was a man of ample means and his wife daughter and co-heiress with mrs tregonell of ralph champernown had a handsome dowry so christabel might fairly rank as an heiress on her grandfather's death she inherited half of the champernown estate which was not entailed but she had hardly ever given a thought to her financial position she knew that she was a ward in chancery and that mrs tregonell was her guardian and adopted mother that she had always as much money as she wanted and never experienced the pain of seeing poverty which she could not relieve in some measure from her well-supplied purse the general opinion in the neighbourhood of mount royal was that the indian judge had accumulated an immense fortune during his twenty years labour as a civil servant but this notion was founded rather upon vague ideas about warren hastings and the pagoda tree and the supposed inability of any indian official to refuse a bribe than on plain facts or personal knowledge mrs tregonell had been left a widow at thirty-five years of age a widow with one son whom she idolized but who was not a source of peace and happiness he was open-handed had no petty vices and was supposed to possess a noble heart a fact which christabel was sometimes inclined to doubt when she saw his delight in the slaughter of birds and beasts not having in her own nature that sportsman's instinct which can excuse such murder he was not the kind of lad who would wilfully set his foot upon a worm but he had no thrill of tenderness or remorseful pity as he looked at the glazing eye or felt against his hand the last feeble heart-beats of snipe or woodcock he was a troublesome boy fond of inferior company and loving rather to be first fiddle in the saddle-room than to mind his manners in his mother's pink and white panelled saloon among the best people in the neighbourhood he was lavish to recklessness in the use of money and therefore was always furnished with followers and flatterers his university career had been altogether a failure and a disgrace he had taken no degree had made himself notorious for those rough pranks which have not even the merit of being original the traditionary college misdemeanours handed down from generation to generation of undergraduates and which by their blatant folly inclined the outside world to vote for the suppression of universities and the extinction of the undergraduate race his mother had known and suffered all this yet still loved her boy with a fond excusing love ever ready to pardon ever eager to believe that these faults and follies were but the crop of wild oats which must needs precede the ripe and rich harvest of manhood such wild youths she told herself fatuously generally make the best men leonard would mend his ways before he was five-and-twenty and would become interested in his estate and develop into a model squire like his admirable father that he had no love for scholarship mattered little a country gentleman with half a dozen manners to look after could be but little advantaged by a familiar acquaintance with the integral calculus or a nice appreciation of the greek tragedians when leonard tregonell and the college dons were mutually disgusted with each other to a point that made any further residence at oxford impossible the young man graciously announced his intention of making a tour round the world for the benefit of his health somewhat impaired by university dissipations and the widening of his experience in the agricultural line farming has been reduced to a science he told his mother i want to see how it works in our colonies 
i mean to make a good many reformations in the management of my farms and the conduct of my tenants when i come home at first loath to part with him very fearful of letting him so far out of her ken mrs tregonell ultimately allowed herself to be persuaded that sea voyages and knocking about in strange lands would be the making of her son and there was no sacrifice no loss of comfort and delight which she would not have endured for his benefit she spent many sad hours in prayer or on her knees before her open bible and at last it seemed to her that her friends and neighbours must be right and that it would be for leonard's good to go if he stayed in england she could not hope to keep him always in cornwall he could go to london and no doubt london vices would be worse than oxford vices yes it was good for him to go she thought of esau and how after a foolish and ill-governed youth the son who had bartered his father's blessing yet became an estimable member of society why should not her boy flourish as esau had flourished but never without the parental blessing that would be his to the end he could not sin beyond her large capacity for pardon he could not exhaust an inexhaustible love so leonard who had suddenly found that wild cornish coast and even the long rollers of the atlantic contemptibly insignificant as compared with the imagined magnitude of australian downs and the grandeurs of botany bay hurried on the preparations for his departure provided himself with everything expensive in gunnery fishing tackle porpoise high thigh boots and waterproof gear of every kind and departed rejoicing in the most admirably appointed australian steamer the family doctor who was one of the many friends in favour of this tour had strongly recommended the rough-and-tumble life of a sailing vessel but leonard preferred the luxury and swiftness of a steamer and suggesting to his mother that a sailing vessel always took out immigrants from whom it was more than likely he would catch scarlet fever or smallpox instantly brought mrs tregonell to perceive that a steamer which carried no second-class passengers was the only fitting conveyance for her son he was gone and while the widow grieved in submissive silence telling herself that it was god's will that she and her son should be parted and that whatever was good for him should be well for her christabel and the rest of the household inwardly rejoiced at his absence nobody openly owned to being happier without him but the knowledge that he was far away brought a sense of relief to every one even to the old servants who had been so fond of him in his childhood when the kitchen and servants hall had ever been a happy hunting ground for him in periods of banishment from the drawing-room it is no good for me to punish him mrs tregonell had remonstrated with assumed displeasure you all make so much of him oh ma'am he is such a fine high-spirited boy the cook would reply on these occasions tisn't possible to be angry with him he has such a spirit such a spirit was only a euphuism for such a temper and as the years went on mr tregonell's visits to the kitchen and servants hall came to be less appreciated by his retainers he no longer went there to be petted to run riot in boyish liveliness upsetting the housemaid's work-boxes or make toffee under the cook's directions as he became aware of his own importance he speedily developed into a juvenile tyrant he became haughty and overbearing hectored and swore befouled the snowy floors and flags with his muddy shooting boots made havoc and work wherever he went the household treated him with unfailing respect as their late master's son and their own master possibly in the future but their service was no longer the service of love his loud strong voice shouting in the passages and lobbies scared the maids at their tea grooms and stable boys liked him for with them he was always familiar and often friendly he and they had tastes and occupations in common but to the women servants and the grave middle-aged butler his presence was a source of discomfort next to her son in mrs tregonell's affection stood her niece christabel that her love for the girl who had never given her a moment's pain should be a lesser love than that which she bore to the boy who had seldom given her an hour's unalloyed pleasure was one of the anomalies common in the lives of good women to love blindly and unreasonably is as natural to a woman as it is to love and happy she whose passionate soul finds its idol in husband or child instead of being lured astray by strange lights outside the safe harbour of home mrs tregonell loved her niece very dearly but it was with that calm comfortable affection which mothers are apt to feel for the child who has never given them any trouble christabel had been her pupil all that the girl knew had been learned from mrs tregonell 
and though her education fell far short of the requirements of girton or harley street there were few girls whose intellectual powers had been more fully awakened without the taint of pedantry christabel loved books but they were the books her aunt had chosen for her old-fashioned books for the most part she loved music but was no brilliant pianist for when mrs tregonell who had taught her carefully up to a certain point suggested a course of lessons from a german professor at plymouth the girl recoiled from the idea of being taught by a stranger if you are satisfied with my playing auntie i am content never to play any better she said so the idea of six months tuition and study at plymouth involving residence in that lively port was abandoned london was a far-away world of which neither aunt nor niece ever thought that wild northern coast is still two days journey from the metropolis only by herculean labour in the way of posting across the moor in the grey dawn of morning can the thing be done in one day and then scarcely between sunrise and sunset so mrs tregonell who loved a life of placid repose had never been to london since her widowhood and christabel had never been there at all there was an old house in mayfair which had belonged to the tregonells for the last hundred years and which had cost them a fortune in repairs but it was either shut up and in the occupation of a caretaker or let furnished for the season and no tregonell had crossed its threshold since the squire's death mrs tregonell talked of spending a season in london before christabel was much older in order that her niece might be duly presented at court and qualified for that place in society which a young lady of good family and ample means might fairly be entitled to hold christabel had no eager desire for the gaieties of a london season she had spent six weeks in bath and had enjoyed an occasional fortnight at plymouth she had been taken to theatres and concerts had seen some of the best actors and actresses heard a good deal of the finest music and had been duly delighted with all she saw and heard but she so fondly loved mount royal and its surroundings she was so completely happy in her home life that she had no desire to change that tranquil existence she had a vague idea that london balls and parties must be something very dazzling and brilliant but she was content to abide her aunt's pleasure and convenience for the time in which she was to know more about metropolitan revelries than was to be gathered from laudatory paragraphs in fashionable newspapers youth with its warm blood and active spirit is rarely so contented as christabel was but then youth is not often placed amidst such harmonious circumstances so protected from the approach of evil christabel courtenay may have thought and talked more about mr hamley during the two or three days that preceded his arrival than was absolutely necessary or strictly in accordance with that common sense which characterized most of her acts and thoughts she was interested in him upon two grounds first because he was the only son of the man her aunt had loved and mourned secondly because he was the first stranger who had ever come as a guest to mount royal her aunt's visitors were mostly people whose faces she had known ever since she could remember there was such wide potentialities in the idea of a perfect stranger who was to be domiciled at the mount for an indefinite period suppose we don't like him she said speculatively to jessie bridgman mrs tregonell's housekeeper companion and factotum who had lived at mount royal for the last six years coming there a girl of twenty to make herself generally useful in small girlish ways and proving herself such a clever manager so bright competent and far-seeing that she had gradually been entrusted with every household care from the largest to the most minute miss bridgman was neither brilliant nor accomplished but she had a genius for homely things and she was admirable as a companion the two girls were out on the hills in the early autumn morning hills that were golden where the sun touched them purple in the shadow the heather was fading the patches of firs blossom were daily growing rarer yet the hillsides were alive with light and colour only less lovely than the translucent blues and greens of yonder wide-stretching sea suppose we should all dislike him repeated christabel digging the point of her walking-stick into a ferny hillock on the topmost edge of a deep cleft in the hills on which commanding spot she had just taken her stand after bounding up the narrow path from the little wooden bridge at the bottom of the glen almost as quickly and as lightly as if she had been one of the deeply ruddled sheep that spent their lives on those precipitous slopes wouldn't it be too dreadful jessie it would be inconvenient answered miss bridgman coolly resting both hands on the horny crook of her sturdy umbrella and gazing placidly seaward but we could cut him not without offending auntie 
she is sure to like him for the sake of old lang syne every look and tone of his will recall his father but we may detest him and if he should like mount royal very much and go on staying there for ever auntie asked him for an indefinite period she showed me her letter i thought it was rather too widely hospitable but i did not like to say so i always say what i think said jessie bridgman doggedly of course you do and go very near being disagreeable in consequence miss bridgman's assertion was perfectly correct a sturdy truthfulness was one of her best qualifications she did not volunteer unfavourable criticism but if you asked her opinion upon any subject you got it without sophistication it was her rare merit to have lived with mrs tregonell and christabel courtenay six years dependent upon their liking or caprice for all the comforts of her life without having degenerated into a flatterer i haven't the slightest doubt as to your liking him said miss bridgman decisively he has spent his life for the most part in cities and in good society that i gather from your aunt's account of him he is sure to be much more interesting and agreeable than the young men who live near here whose ideas are for the most part strictly local but i very much doubt his liking mount royal for more than one week jessie cried christabel indignantly how can he help liking this she waved her stick across the autumn landscape describing a circle which included the gold and bronze hills the shadowy gorges the bold headlands curving away to heartland on one side to tintagel on the other lundy island a dim line of dun colour on the horizon no doubt he will think it beautiful in the abstract he will rave about it compare it with the scottish highlands with wales with Kerry, declare these cornish hills the crowning glory of britain but in three days he will begin to detest a place where there is only one post out and in and where he has to wait till next day for his morning paper what can he want with newspapers if he is enjoying his life with us i am sure there are books enough at mount royal he need not expire for want of something to read do you suppose that books the best and noblest that ever were written can make up to a man for the loss of his daily paper if you do offer a man shakespeare when he is looking for the daily telegraph or chaucer when he wants his times and see what he will say to you men don't want to read nowadays but to know to be posted in the very latest movements of their fellow-men all over the universe reuter's column is all anybody really cares for in the paper the leaders and the criticism are only so much padding to fill the sheet people would be better pleased if there were nothing but telegrams a man who only reads newspapers must be a most vapid companion said christabel hardly for he must be brimful of facts i abhor facts well if mr hamley is that kind of person i hope he may be tired of the mount in less than a week she was silent and thoughtful as they went home by the monastic churchyard in the hollow the winding lane and steep village street jessie had a message to carry to one of mrs tregonell's pensioners who lived in a cottage in the lane but christabel who was generally pleased to show her fair young face in such abodes waited outside on this occasion and stood in a profound reverie digging the point of her stick into the loose earth of the mossy bank in front of her and seriously damaging the landscape i hate a man who does not care for books who does not love our dear english poets she said to herself but i must not say that before auntie it would be almost like saying that i hated my cousin leonard i hope mr hamley will be just a little different from leonard of course he will if his life has been spent in cities but then he may be languid and supercilious looking upon jessie and me as inferior creatures and that would be worse than leonard's roughness for we all know what a good heart leonard has and how warmly attached he is to us somehow the idea of leonard's excellent heart and affectionate disposition was not altogether a pleasant one christabel shuddered ever so faintly as she stood in the lane thinking of her cousin who had last been heard of in the fijis she banished his image with an effort and returned to her consideration of that unknown quantity angus hamley i am an idiot to be making fancy pictures of him when at seven o'clock this evening i shall know all about him for good or evil she said aloud as jessie came out of the cottage which nestled low down in its little garden with a slate for a doorstep and a slate standing on end at each side of the door for boundary line or ornament all that is to be known of the outside of him said jessie answering the girl's outspoken thought 
if he is really worth knowing his mind will need a longer study i think i shall know at the first glance if he is likable replied christabel and then with a tremendous effort she contrived to talk about other things as they went down the high street of beaucastle which to people accustomed to a level world is rather trying with christabel the hills were only an excuse for flourishing a swiss walking-stick the stick was altogether needless for support to that light well-balanced figure jessie who was very small and slim and sure-footed always carried her stout little umbrella winter or summer it was her vade mecum good against rain or sun or mad bulls or troublesome dogs she would have scorned the affectation of cane or alpenstock but the sturdy umbrella was very dear to her End of chapter one Chapter two of Mount Royal Volume one by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two. But then came one, the lovelace of his day. Although Angus Hamley came of a good old West Country family, he had never been in Cornwall, and he approached that remote part of the country with a curious feeling that he was turning his back upon England and English civilization and entering a strange wild land where all things would be different he would meet with a half barbarous people perhaps rough unkempt ignorant brutal speaking to him in a strange language such men as inhabited perthshire and inverness before civilization travelled northward he had accepted mrs tregonell's invitation out of kindly feeling for the woman who had loved his father and who but for that father's untimely death might have been to him as a second mother there was a strong vein of sentiment in his character which responded to the sentiment betrayed unconsciously in every line of mrs tregonell's letter his only knowledge of the father he had lost in infancy had come to him from the lips of others and it pleased him to think that here was one whose memory must be fresher than that of any other friend in whose mind his father's image must needs be as a living thing he had all his life cherished a regretful fondness for that unknown father whose shadowy picture he had vainly tried to recall among the first recollections of babyhood the dim dreamland of half-awakened consciousness he had frankly and promptly accepted mrs tregonell's invitation yet he felt that in going to immure himself in an old manor-house for a fortnight anything less than a fortnight would have been uncivil he was dooming himself to ineffable boredom beyond that pious pleasure in parental reminiscences there could be no possible gratification for a man of the world who was not an ardent sportsman in such a place as mount royal mr hamley's instincts were of the town towny his pleasures were all of an intellectual kind he had never degraded himself by vulgar profligacy but he liked a life of excitement and variety he had always lived at high pressure and among people posted up to the last moment of the world's history people who drank the very latest pleasure cup with the spirit of the age a spirit of passing frivolity had invented were it only the newest brand of champagne and who in their eagerness to gather the roses of life outstripped old time himself and grew old in advance of their age he had been contemplating a fortnight in paris as the first stage in his journey to monaco when mrs tregonell's letter altered his plans this was not the first time she had asked him to mount royal but on previous occasions his engagements had seemed to him too imperative to be foregone and he had regretfully declined her invitations but now the flavour of life had grown somewhat vapid for him and he was grateful to any one who would turn his thoughts and fancies into a new direction i shall inevitably be bored there he said to himself when he had littered the railway carriage with newspapers accumulated on the way but i should be bored anywhere else when a man begins to feel the pressure of the chain upon his leg it cannot much matter where his walks lead him the very act of walking is his punishment when a man comes to eight-and-twenty years of age a man who has had very little to do in this life except to take his pleasure a great weariness and sense of exhaustion is apt to close around him like a pall the same man will be ever so much fresher in mind will have ever so much more zest for life when he comes to be forty for then he will have entered upon those calmer enjoyments of middle age which may last him till he is eighty but at eight-and-twenty there is a death-like calmness of feeling youth is gone he has consumed all the first roots of life spring and summer with their wealth of flowers are over only the quiet autumn remains for him 
with her warm browns and dull greys and cool moist breath the fires upon youth's altars have all died out youth is dead and the man who was young only yesterday fancies that he might as well be dead also what is there left for him can there be any charm in this life when the looker-on has grey hair and wrinkles having nothing in life to do except seek his own pleasure and spend his ample income angus hamley had naturally taken the time of life's march prestissimo he had never paused in his rose gathering to wonder whether there might not be a few thorns among the flowers and whether he might not find them afterwards and now the blossoms were all withered and he was beginning to discover the lasting quality of the thorns they were such thorns as interfered somewhat with the serenity of his days and he was glad to turn his face westward away from everybody he knew or who knew anything about him my character will present itself to mrs tregonell as a blank page he said to himself i wonder what she would think of me if one of my club gossips had enjoyed a quiet evening's talk with her beforehand a dear friend's analysis of one's character and conduct is always so flattering to both and i have a pleasant knack of offending my dearest friends mr hamley began to look a little about him when the train had left plymouth the landscape was wild and romantic but had none of that stern ruggedness which he expected to behold on the cornish border deep glens and wooded dells with hillsides steep and broken but verdant to their topmost crest and the most wonderful oak coppices that he ever remembered to have seen miles upon miles of oak as it seemed to him now sinking into the depth of a valley now mounting to the distant skyline while from that verdant undulating surface of young wood there stood forth the giants of the grove wide spreading oak and towering beech the mighty growth of many centuries between lidford and launceston the scenery grew tamer he had fancied those deep ravines and wooded heights the prelude to a vast and awful symphony but mary tavy and lifton showed him only a pastoral landscape with just so much wood and water as would have served for a creswick or a constable and with none of these grand salvatoresque effects which he had admired in the country round tavistock at launceston he found mrs tregonell's landau waiting for him with a pair of powerful chestnuts and a couple of servants whose neat brown liveries had nothing of that unsophisticated semi-savagery which mr hamley had expected in a place so remote do you drive that way he asked pointing to the almost perpendicular street yes sir replied the coachman then i think i'll stroll to the top of the hill while you are putting in my portmanteau he said and ascended the rustic street at a leisurely pace looking about him as he went the thoroughfare which leads from launceston station to the ruined castle at the top of the hill is not an imposing promenade its architectural features might perhaps be best described like the snakes of ireland as nil but here and there an old-fashioned lattice with a row of flower-pots an ancient gable or a bit of cottage garden hints at the picturesque any late additions to the domestic architecture of launceston favour the unpretending usefulness of camden town rather than the aspiring aestheticism of chelsea or bedford park but to mr hamley's eye the rugged old castle keep on the top of the hill made amends he was not an ardent archaeologist and he did not turn out of his way to see launceston church which might well have rewarded him for his trouble he was content to have spared those good-looking chestnuts the labour of dragging him up the steep here they came springing up the hill he took his place in the carriage pulled the fur rug over his knees and ensconced himself comfortably in the roomy back seat this is a sybaritish luxury which i was not prepared for he said to himself i am afraid i shall be rather more bored than i expected i thought mrs tregonell and her surroundings would at least have the merit of originality but here is a carriage that must have been built by peters and liveries that suggest the sartorial excellence of conduit street or savile row he watched the landscape with a critical eye prepared for disappointment and disillusion first a country road between tall ragged hedges and steep banks a road where every now and then the branches of the trees hung low over the carriage and threatened to knock the coachman's hat off then they came out upon the wide waste of moorland a thousand feet above the sea level and mr hamley acclimatized to the atmosphere of club-houses buttoned his overcoat drew the black fur rug closer about him and shivered a little as the keen breath of the atlantic sweeping over far-reaching tracts of hill and heather blew round him far and wide as his gaze could reach 
he saw no sign of human habitation. Was the land utterly forsaken? No. A little farther on they passed a hamlet so insignificant, so isolated, that it seemed rather as if half a dozen cottages had dropped from the sky than that so lonely a settlement could be the result of deliberate human inclination. Never in Scotland or Ireland had Mr. Hamley seen a more barren landscape or a poorer soil. Yet those wild wastes of heath, those distant tours were passing beautiful, and the air he breathed was more inspiring and exhilarating than the atmosphere of any vaunted health resort which he had ever visited. "'I think I might live to middle age if I were to pitch my tent on this Cornish plateau,' he thought. "'But then there are so many things in this life that are worth more than mere length of days.' he asked the names of the hamlets they passed this lonely church dedicated to st david whence oh whence came the congregation belonged to the parish of david stowe and here there was a holy well and here a vicarage and there oh crowning evidence of civilization a post office and there a farmhouse and that was the end of david stowe a little later they came to cross roads and the coachman touched his hat and said this is victoria as if he were naming a town or settlement of some kind mr hamley looked about him and beheld a low-roofed cottage which he assumed to be some kind of public house possibly capable of supplying beer and tobacco but other vestige of human habitation there was none he leaned back in the carriage looking across the hills and saying to himself why victoria was that unpretentious and somewhat dilapidated hostelry the victoria hotel or the victoria arms or was royalty's honoured name given in an arbitrary manner to the cross-roads and the granite finger-post he never knew the coachman said shortly victoria and as victoria he ever after heard that spot described and now the journey was all downhill they drove downward and downward until mr hamley began to feel as if they were travelling towards the centre of the earth as if they had got altogether below the outer crust of this globe and must be gradually nearing the unknown gulfs beneath yet by some geographical mystery when they turned out of the high road and went in at a lodge gate and drove gently upward along an avenue of elms in whose rugged tops the rooks were screaming mr hamley found that he was still high above the undulating edges of the cliffs that overtopped the atlantic while the great waste of waters lay far below golden with the last rays of the setting sun they drove by a gentle ascent to the stone porch of mount royal and here mrs tregonell stood facing the sunset with an indian shawl wrapped round her waiting for her guest i heard the carriage mr hamley she said as angus alighted i hope you do not think me too impatient to see what change twelve years have made in you i'm afraid they have not been particularly advantageous to me he answered lightly as they shook hands how good of you to receive me on the threshold and what a delightful place you have here before i got to launceston i began to be afraid that cornwall was commonplace and now i am enchanted with it your moors and hills are like fairyland to me it is a world of our own and we are very fond of it said the widow i shall be sorry if ever a railway makes Bocastle open to everybody and what a noble old house exclaimed angus as he followed his hostess across the oak-panelled hall with its wide shallow staircase curiously carved balustrades and lantern roof are you quite alone here oh no i have my niece and a young lady who is a companion to both of us angus hamley shuddered three women he was to exist for a fortnight in a house with three solitary females a niece rustic and gawky the companion sour and frumpish he began hurriedly to cast about in his mind for a convenient friend to whom he could telegraph to send him a telegram summoning him back to london on urgent business he was still meditating this when the butler opened the door of a spacious room lined from floor to ceiling with books and he followed mrs tregonell in and found himself in the bosom of the family the simple picture of home comfort of restfulness and domestic peace which met his curious gaze as he entered pleased him better than anything he had seen of late club life with its too studious indulgence of man's native selfishness and love of ease fashionable life with its insatiable craving for that latter-day form of display which calls itself culture art or beauty had afforded him no vision so enchanting as the wide hearth and high chimney of this sober book-lined room 
with the fair and girlish form kneeling in front of the old dog stove framed in the glaring light of the fire the tea-table had been wheeled near the hearth and miss bridgeman sat before the bright red tea-tray and old brass kettle ready to administer to the wants of the traveller who would be hardly human if he did not thirst for a cup of tea after driving across the moor christabel knelt in front of the fire worshipping and being worshipped by a sleek black and white sheep-dog native to the soil and of a rare intelligence a creature by no means approaching the scotch collie in physical beauty but of a fond and faithful nature born to be the friend of man as christabel rose and turned to greet the stranger mr hamley was agreeably reminded of an old picture a lady or a neller perhaps this was not in any wise the rustic image which had flashed across his mind at the mention of mrs tregonell's niece he had expected to see a bouncing countrified maiden rosy buxom the picture of commonplace health and vigour the girl he saw was nearer skin to the lily than the rose tall slender dazzlingly fair not fragile or sickly in any wise for the erect figure was finely moulded the swan-like throat was round and full he was prepared for the florid beauty of a milkmaid and he found himself face to face with the elegance of an ideal duchess the picturesque loveliness of an old venetian portrait christabel's dark brown velvet gown and square point lace collar the bright hair falling in shadowy curls over her forehead and rolled into a loose knot at the back of her head sinned in no wise against mr hamley's notions of good taste there was a picturesqueness about the style which indicated that miss courtenay belonged to that advanced section of womankind which takes its ideas less from modern fashion plates than from old pictures so long as her archaism went no further back than van dyck or moroni he would admire and approve but he shuddered at the thought that to-morrow she might burst upon him in a medieval morning-gown with high-shouldered sleeves a ruff and a satchel the picturesque idea was good within limits but one never knew how far it might go there was nothing picturesque about the lady sitting before the tea-tray who looked up brightly and gave him a gracious bend of her small neat head in acknowledgment of mrs tregonell's introduction mr hamley miss bridgman this was the companion and the companion was plain not unpleasantly plain not in any manner repulsive but a lady about whose looks there could be hardly any compromise her complexion was of a sallow darkness unrelieved by any glow of colour her eyes were grey acute honest friendly but not beautiful her nose was sharp and pointed not at all a bad nose but there was a hardness about nose and mouth and chin as of features cut out of bone with a very sharp knife her teeth were good and in a lovelier mouth might have been the object of much admiration her hair was of that nondescript monotonous brown which has been unkindly called bottled green but it was arranged with admirable neatness and offended less than many a tangled pate upon whose locks of spurious gold the owner has wasted much time and money there was nothing unpardonable in miss bridgman's plainness as angus hamley said of her later her small figure was neatly made and her dark grey gown fitted to perfection i hope you like the little bit of cornwall that you have seen this afternoon mr hamley said christabel seating herself in a low chair in the shadow of the tall chimney-piece fenced in by her aunt's larger chair i am enraptured with it i came here with a desire to be intensely cornish i am prepared to believe in witches warlocks we have no warlocks said christabel they belong to the north well then wise women wicked young men who play football on sunday and get themselves turned into granite rocking stones magic wells druids and king arthur i believe the principal point is to be open to conviction about arthur now i am prepared to swallow everything his castle the river where his crown was found after the fight was it his crown by the by or somebody else's which he found his hair brushes his boots anything you please to show me we will show you his quoit to-morrow on the road to tintagel said miss bridgman i don't think you would like to swallow that actually he hurled it from tintagel to trevalga in one of its sportive moods we shall be able to give you plenty of amusement if you are a good walker and are fond of hills i adore them in the abstract contemplated from one's windows or in a picture but there is an incompatibility between the human anatomy and a road set on end like a ladder which i have never yet overcome 
apart from the outside question of my legs which are obvious failures when tested by an angle of forty-five degrees i am afraid my internal machinery is not quite so tough as it ought to be for a thorough enjoyment of mountaineering mrs tregonell sighed ever so faintly in the twilight she was thinking of her first lover and how that fragility which meant early death had showed itself in his inability to enjoy the moorland walks which were the delight of her girlhood the natural result of bad habits said miss bridgman briskly how can you expect to be strong or active when i dare say you have spent the better part of your life in handsome cabs and express trains i don't mean to be impertinent but i know that is the general way with gentlemen out of the shooting and hunting season and as i am no sportsman i am somewhat exaggerated example of the vice of laziness fostered by congenial circumstances acting on a lymphatic temperament if you write books as i believe most ladies do nowadays you should put me into one of them as an awful warning i don't write books and if i did i would not flatter your vanity by making you my model sinner retorted jessie but i'll do something better for you if christabel will help me i'll reform you a million thanks for the mere thought i hope the process will be pleasant i hope so too we shall begin by walking you off your legs they are so indifferent as a means of locomotion that i could very well afford to lose them if you could hold out any hope of my getting a better pair a week hence if you submit to my treatment you will be as active as a chamois hunter in manfred enchanting always provided that you and miss courtenay will follow the chase with me depend upon it we shall not trust you to take your walks alone unless you have a pedometer which will bear witness to the distance you have done and which you will be content to submit to our inspection on your return replied jessie sternly i am afraid that you are a terribly severe high priestess of this new form of culture said mr hamley looking up from his teacup with a lazy smile almost as bad as the dweller on the threshold in bulwer's zanoni there is a dweller on the threshold of every science and every admirable mode of life and his name is idleness answered miss bridgman the vici nertie the force of letting things alone said angus yes that is a tremendous power nobly exemplified by vestries and board of works to say nothing of cabinets bishops and the high court of chancery i delight in that verse of scripture their strength is to sit still there shall be very little sitting still for you if you submit yourself to christabel and me replied miss bridgman i have never tried the water cure the descriptions i have heard from adepts have been too repellent but i have an idea that this system of yours must be rather worse than hydropathy said angus musingly evidently very much entertained at the way in which miss bridgman had taken him in hand i was not going to let him pose after lamartine's poet mourant just because his father died of lung disease said jessie ten minutes afterwards when the warning gong had sounded and mr hamley had gone to his room to dress for dinner and the two young women were whispering together before the fire while mrs tregonell indulged in a placid doze do you think he is consumptive like his father asked christabel with a compassionate look he has a very delicate appearance hollow-cheeked and prematurely old like a man who has lived on tobacco and brandy and soda and has spent his nights in club-house card-rooms we have no right to suppose that said christabel since we know really nothing about him major bree told me that he has lived a rackety life and that if he were not to pull up very soon he would be ruined both in health and fortune what can the major know about him exclaimed christabel contemptuously this major bree was a great friend of christabel's but there are times when one's nearest and dearest are too provoking for endurances major bree has been buried alive in cornwall for the last twenty years he is at least a quarter of a century behind the age she said impatiently he spent a fortnight in london the year before last said jessie it was then that he heard such a bad account of mr hamley did he go about to clubs and places making inquiries like a private detective said christabel still contemptuous i hate such fetching and carrying here he comes to answer for himself replied jessie as the door opened and a servant announced major bree mrs tregonell started from her slumbers at the opening of the door and rose to greet her guest he was a very frequent visitor so frequent that he might be said to live at mount royal although his nominal abode was a cottage on the outskirts of beaucastle 
a stone cottage on the crest of a steep hillside with a delightful little garden perched as it were on the edge of a verdant abyss he was tall stout elderly grey and florid altogether a comfortable-looking man clean-shaved save for a thin grey moustache with the genuine cavalry droop iron grey eyebrows which looked like a repetition of the moustache on a somewhat smaller scale keen grey eyes a pleasant smile and a well set up figure he dressed well with a sobriety becoming his years and was always the pink of neatness a man welcome everywhere on account of an inborn pleasantness which prompted him always to say and do the right thing but most of all welcome at mount royal as a first cousin of the late squire's and mrs tregonell's guide philosopher and friend in all matters relating to the outside world of which despite his twenty years hibernation at beaucastle the widow supposed him to be an acute observer and an infallible judge was he not one of the few inhabitants of that western village who took in the times newspaper well exclaimed major bree addressing himself generally to the three ladies he has come what do you think of him he is painfully like his poor father said mrs tregonell he has a most interesting face and winning manner and i'm afraid we shall all get ridiculously fond of him said miss bridgman decisively christabel said nothing she knelt on the hearth rug playing with randy the black and white sheep-dog and what have you to say about him christabel asked the major nothing i have not had time to form an opinion replied the girl and then lifting her clear blue eyes to the major's friendly face she said gravely but i think uncle oliver it was very unkind and unfair of you to prejudice jessie against him before he came here unkind unfair here's a shower of abuse i prejudice oh i remember mrs tregonell asked me what people thought of him in london and i was obliged to acknowledge that his reputation was well no better than that of the majority of young men who have more money than common sense but that was two years ago nous avons changé tout cela if he was wicked then he must be wicked now said christabel wicked is a monstrously strong word said the major besides that does not follow a man may have a few wild oats to sow and yet become a very estimable person afterwards miss bridgman is tremendously sharp she'll be able to find out all about mr hamley from personal observation before he has been here a week i defy him to hide his weak points from her what is the use of being plain and insignificant if one has not some advantage over one's superior fellow-creatures asked jessie miss bridgman has too much expression to be plain and she is far too clever to be insignificant said major bree with a stately bow he always put on a stately manner when he addressed himself to jessie bridgman and treated her in all things with as much respect as if she had been a queen he explained to christabel that this was the homage which he paid to the royalty of intellect but christabel had a shrewd suspicion that the major cherished a secret passion for miss bridgman as exalted and as hopeless as the love that chastelard bore for mary stuart he had only a small pittance besides his half-pay and he had a very poor opinion of his own merits so it was but natural that at fifty-five he should hesitate to offer himself to a young lady of six-and-twenty of whose sharp tongue he had a wholesome awe mr hamley came back before much more could be said about him and a few minutes afterwards they all went in to dinner and in the brighter lamplight of the dining-room major bree and the three ladies had a better opportunity of forming their opinion as to the external graces of their guest he was good-looking that fact even malice could hardly dispute not so handsome as the absent leonard mrs tregonell told herself complacently but she was constrained at the same time to acknowledge that her son's broadly moulded features and florid complexion lacked the charm and interest which a woman's eye found in the delicate chiselling and subdued tones of angus hamley's countenance his eyes were darkest grey his complexion was fair and somewhat pallid his hair brown with a natural curl which neither fashion nor the barber could altogether suppress his cheeks were more sunken than they should have been at eight-and-twenty and the large dark eyes were unnaturally bright all this the three ladies and major bree had ample time for observing during the leisurely course of dinner there was no flagging in the conversation from the beginning to the end of the repast 
mr hamley was ready to talk about anything and everything and his interest in the most trifling local subjects whether real or assumed made him a delightful companion in the drawing-room after dinner he proved even more admirable for he discovered a taste for and knowledge of the best music which delighted jessie and christabel who were both enthusiasts he had read every book they cared for and a wide world of books besides and was able to add to their stock of information upon all their favourite subjects without the faintest touch of arrogance i don't think you can help liking him jessie said christabel as the two girls went upstairs to bed the younger lingered a little in miss bridgman's room for the discussion of their latest ideas there was a cheerful fire burning in the large basket grate for autumn nights were chill upon that wild coast christabel assumed her favourite attitude in front of the fire with her faithful randy winking and blinking at her and the fire alternately he was a privileged dog allowed to sleep on the sheepskin mat in the gallery outside his mistress's door and to go into her room every morning in company with the maid who carried her early cup of tea when after the exchange of a few remarks in baby language on her part and expressed on his by a series of curious grins and much wagging of his insignificant apology for a tail he would dash out of the room and out of the house for his morning constitutional among the sheep upon some distant hill coming home with an invigorated appetite in time for the family breakfast at nine o'clock i don't think you can help liking him as as a casual acquaintance repeated christabel finding that jessie stood in a dreamy silence twisting her one diamond ring a birthday gift from miss courtenay round and round upon her slender finger i don't suppose any of us can help liking him jessie answered at last with her eyes on the fire all i hope is that some of us will not like him too much he has brought a new element into our lives a new interest which may end by being a painful one i feel distrustful of him why distrustful why jessie you who are generally the very essence of flippancy who make light of almost everything in life except religion thank god you have not come to that yet you to be so serious about such a trifling matter as a visit from a man who will most likely be gone back to london in a fortnight gone out of our lives altogether perhaps for i don't suppose he will care to repeat his experiences in a lonely country house he may be gone perhaps yes and it is quite possible that he may never return but shall we be quite the same after he has left us will nobody regret him wish for his return yearn for it sigh for it die for it feeling life worthless a burden without him why jessie you look like a pythoness bell bell my darling my innocent one you do not know what it is to care for a bright particular star and know how remote it is from your life never to be brought any nearer i felt afraid to-night when i saw you and mr hamley at the piano you playing he leaning over you as you played both seeming so happy so united by the sympathy of the moment if he is not a good man if but we have no reason to think ill of him you remember what uncle oliver said he had only been a uh, a little rackety like other young men said christabel eagerly and then with a sudden embarrassment reddening and laughing shyly she added and indeed jessie if it is any idea of danger to me that is troubling your wise head there is no need for alarm i am not made of such inflammable stuff i am not the kind of girl to fall in love with the first comer with the first comer no but when the prince comes in a fairy tale it matters little whether he come first or last fate has settled the whole story beforehand fate has nothing to say about me and mr hamley no jessie believe me there is no danger for me and i don't suppose that you are going to fall in love with him because i am so old said miss bridgman still looking at the fire no it would rather be ridiculous in a person of my age plain and passe to fall in love with your alcibiades no jessie but because you are too wise ever to be carried away by a sentimental fancy but why do you speak of him so contemptuously one would think you had taken a dislike to him we ought at least to remember that he is my aunt's friend and the son of some one she once dearly loved once repeated jessie softly does not once in that case mean always she was thinking of the squire's commonplace good looks and portly figure as represented in the big picture in the dining-room 
the picture of a man in a red coat leaning against the shoulder of a big bay horse and with a pack of harriers fawning round him and wondering whether the image of that dead man whose son was in the house to-night had not sometimes obtruded itself upon the calm plenitude of mrs tregonell's domestic joys don't be afraid that i shall forget my duty to your aunt or your aunt's guest dear she said suddenly as if awaking from a reverie you and i will do all in our power to make him happy and to shake him out of lazy london ways and then when we have patched up his health and the moorland air has blown a little colour into his hollow cheeks we will send him back to his clubs and his theatres and forget all about him and now good night my christabel she said looking at her watch see it is close upon midnight dreadful dissipation for mount royal where half-past ten is the usual hour christabel kissed her and departed randy following to the door of her chamber such a pretty room with old panelled walls painted pink and grey old furniture old china snowy draperies and books a girl's daintily bound books selected and purchased by herself in every available corner a neat cottage piano in a recess a low easy chair by the fire with a five o'clock tea-table in front of it desks portfolios work-baskets all the frivolities of a girl's life but everything arranged with a womanly neatness which indicated industrious habits and a well-ordered mind no scattered sheets of music no fancy work pitched and tossed about the room no slovenliness claiming to be excused as artistic disorder christabel said her prayers and read her accustomed portion of scripture but not without some faint wrestlings with satan who on this occasion took the shape of angus hamley her mind was overcharged with wonder at this new phenomenon in daily life a man so entirely different from any of the men she had ever met hitherto so accomplished so highly cultured yet taking his accomplishments and culture as a thing of course as if all men were so she thought of him as she lay awake for the first hour of the still night watching the fire fade and die and listening to the long roll of the waves hardly audible at mount royal amidst all the commonplace noises of day but heard in the solemn silence of night she let her fancy shape a vision of her aunt's vanished youth that one brief bright dream of happiness so miserably broken and wondered and wondered how it was possible for any one to outlive such a grief still more incredible did it seem that any one who had so loved and so lost could ever listen to another lover and yet the thing had been done and mrs tregonell's married life had been called happy she always spoke of the squire as the best of men was never weary of praising him loved to look up at his portrait on the wall preserved every unpicturesque memorial of his unpicturesque life heavy gold and silver snuff-boxes clumsy hunting crops spurs guns fishing-rods the relics of his murderous pursuits would have filled an arsenal and how fondly she loved the son who resembled that departed father save in lacking some of his best qualities how she doted on leonard the most commonplace and unattractive of young men the thought of her cousin set christabel on a new train of speculation if leonard had been at home when mr hamley came to mount royal how would they two have suited each other like fire and water like oil and vinegar like the wolf and the lamb like any two creatures most antagonistic by nature it was a happy accident that leonard was away she was still thinking when she fell asleep with that uneasy sense of pain and trouble in the future which was always suggested to her by leonard's image a dim unshapen difficulty waiting for her somewhere along the untrodden road of her life a lion in the path End of chapter two chapter three of mount royal volume one by mary elizabeth Braden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three tintagel half in sea and half on land there was no sense of fear or trouble of any kind in the mind of anybody next morning after breakfast when christabel miss bridgman and mr hamley started in the young lady's own particular pony carriage for an exploring day attended by randy who was intensely excited and furnished with a picnic basket which made them independent of the inn at trevena and afforded the opportunity of taking one's luncheon under difficulties upon a windy height rather than with the commonplace comforts of an hotel parlour guarded against wind and weather they were going to do an immense deal upon this first day 
christabel in her eagerness wanted to exhibit all her lions at once of course you must see tintagel she said everybody who comes to this part of the world is in a tremendous hurry to see king arthur's castle i have known people set out in the middle of the night and have you ever known any one of them who was not just a little disappointed with that stupendous monument of traditional royalty asked miss bridgeman with her most prosaic air they expect so much halls and towers and keep and chapel and find only ruined walls and the faint indication of a graveyard king arthur is a name to conjure with and tintagel is like mont blanc or the pyramids it can never be so grand as the vision its very name has evoked i blush to say that i have thought very little about tintagel hitherto said mr hamley it has not been an integral part of my existence so my expectations are more reasonable than those of the enthusiastic tourist i promise to be delighted with your ruins oh but you will pretend said christabel and that will be hateful i would rather have to deal with one of those provoking people who look about them blankly and exclaim is this all and who stand in the very centre of arthur's hall and ask and pray where is tintagel when are we to see the castle no give me the man who can take the grandeur of that wild height at a glance and whose fancy can build up those ruined walls recreate those vanished towers fill the halls with knights in shining armour and lovely ladies see guinevere herself upon her throne clothed in white samite mystic wonderful and with lancelot in the background said mr hamley i think the less we say about guinevere the better and your snaky vivian and your senile merlin your prying modred what a disreputable set these round-table people seem to have been altogether they need have been dead thirteen hundred years for us to admire them they were driving along the avenue by this time the stout chestnut cob going gaily in the fresh morning air mr hamley sitting face to face with christabel as she drove what a fair face it was in the clear light of day how pure and delicate every tone from the whiteness of the lily to the bloom of the wild rose how innocent the expression of the large liquid eyes which seemed to smile at him as he talked he had known so many pretty women his memory was like a gallery of beautiful faces but he could recall no face so completely innocent so divinely young it is the youthfulness of an unsullied mind he said to himself i have known plenty of girls as young in years but not one perfectly pure from the taint of worldliness and vanity the trail of the serpent was over them all they drove downhill into bow castle and then straightway began to ascend still steeper hills upon the other side of the harbour you ought to throw a viaduct across the valley said mr hamley something like brunel's bridge at saltash but perhaps you have hardly traffic enough to make it pay they went winding up the new road to trevina avoiding the village street and leaving the church of the silent tower on its windy height on their right hand the wide atlantic lay far below them on the other side of those green fields which bordered the road the air they breathed was keen with the soft breath of the sea but autumn had hardly plucked a leaf from the low storm-beaten trees or a flower from the tall hedgerows where the red blossom of the ragged robin mixed with the pale gold of the hawkweed and the fainter yellow of the wild cistus the ferns had hardly begun to wither and angus hamley whose last experiences had been among the stone walls of aberdeenshire wondered at the luxuriance of this western world where the banks were built up and fortified with boulders of marple veined spar they drove through the village of trevalga in which there is never an inn or public house of any kind not even a cottage licensed for the sale of beer there was the wheelwright carpenter builder jack of all trades with his shed and his yard the blacksmith with his forge going merrily village school steam threshing machine at work church chapel but never a drop of beer and yet the people at trevalca are healthy and industrious and decently clad and altogether comfortable looking some day we will take you to call on the rectory said christabel pointing skywards with her whip do you mean that the rector has gone to heaven asked angus looking up into the distant blue or is there any earthly habitation higher than the road on which we are driving didn't you see the end of the lane just now asked christabel laughing it is rather steep an uphill walk all the way but the views are lovely we will walk to the rectory to-morrow said miss bridgman 
this lazy mode of transit must not be tolerated after to-day even the drive to trevena was not all idleness for after they had passed the entrance to the path leading to the beautiful waterfall of st nectan's kiev hard by st pierin's chapel and well the former degraded to a barn and the latter once of holy repute now chiefly useful as a cool repository for butter from the neighbouring dairy of tretherby farm they came to a hill which had to be walked down to the lowest depth of the rocky valley where a stone bridge spans the rapid brawling stream that leaps as a waterfall into the gorge of st nectan's kiev about a mile higher up the valley and then they came to a corresponding hill which had to be walked up because in either case it was bad for the cob to have a weight behind him indeed the cob was so accustomed to consideration in this matter that he made a point of stopping politely for his people to alight at either end of anything exceptional in the way of a hill i'm afraid you spoil your pony said mr hamley throwing the reins over his arm and resigning himself to a duty which made him feel very much like a seaside flyman earning his day's wages toilsomely and saving his horse with a view to future fares better that than to spoil you answered miss bridgman as she and christabel walked briskly beside him but if you fasten the reins to the dashboard you may trust felix won't he run away not he answered christabel he knows that he would never be so happy with anybody else as he is with us but mightn't he take a fancy for a short run just far enough to allow of his reducing that dainty little carriage to match wood a well-fed underworked pony so thoroughly enjoys that kind of thing felix has no such diabolical suggestions he is a conscientious person and knows his duty besides he is not underworked there is hardly a day that he does not carry us somewhere mr hamley surrendered the reins and felix showed himself worthy of his mistress's confidence following at her heels like a dog with his honest brown eyes fixed on the tall slim figure as if it had been his guiding star i want you to admire the landscape said christabel when they were on the crest of the last hill is not that a lovely valley mr hamley willingly admitted the fact the beauty of a pastoral landscape with just enough of rugged wildness for the picturesque could go no further creswick has immortalized yonder valley by his famous picture of the mill said miss bridgman but the romantic old mill of the picture has lately been replaced by that large ungainly building quite out of keeping with its surroundings have you ever been in switzerland asked angus of christabel when they had stood for some moments in silent contemplation of the landscape never nor in italy no i have never been out of england since i was five years old i have hardly spent a year of my life out of cornwall happy cornwall which can show so fair a product of its soil well miss courtenay i know italy and switzerland by heart and i like this cornish landscape better than either it is not so beautiful it would not do as well for a painter or a poet but it comes nearer an englishman's heart what can one have better than the hills and the sea switzerland can show you bigger hills ghostly snow-shrouded pinnacles that mock the eye following each other like a line of phantoms losing themselves in the infinite but switzerland cannot show you that he pointed to the atlantic the long undulating line of the coast rocky rugged yet verdant with many a curve and promontory many a dip and rise it is the most everlasting kind of beauty is it not asked christabel delighted at this little gush of warm feeling in one whose usual manner was so equable one could never tire of the sea and i am always proud to remember that our sea is so big stretching away and away to the new world i should have liked it still better before the days of columbus when it led to the unknown ah sighed angus youth always yearns for the undiscovered middle age knows that there is nothing worth discovering on the top of the hill they paused for a minute or so to contemplate the ancient borough of bossany which until disfranchised in eighteen thirty two returned two members to parliament with a constituency of little more than a dozen and which once had sir francis drake for its representative here mr hamley beheld that modest mound called the castle hill on the top of which it was customary to read the writs before the elections an hour later they were eating their luncheon on that windy height where once stood the castle of the great king to christabel the whole story of arthur and his knights was as real as if it had been a part of her own life 
she had tennyson's arthur and tennyson's lancelot in her heart of hearts and knew just enough of sir thomas mallory's prose to give substance to the laureate's poetic shadows angus amused himself a little at her expense as they ate their chicken and salad on the grassy mounds which were supposed to be the graves of heroes who died before athelstane drove the cornish across the tamar and made his victorious progress through the country even to the Scilly isles after defeating howell the last king of cornwall do you really think that gentlemanly creature in the laureate's epic that most polished and perfect and most intensely modern english gentleman self-contained considered of others always the right man in the right place is one wit like that half-naked sixth-century savage the real arthur whose court costume was a coat of blue paint and whose war shriek was the yell of a red indian what can be more futile than our setting up any one arthur and bowing the knee before him in the face of the fact that great britain teems with monuments of arthur's arthur's seat in scotland arthur's castle in wales arthur's round table here there and everywhere be sure that arthur ard here the highest chief was a generic name for the princes of those days and that there were more arthurs than ever there were caesars i don't believe one word you say exclaimed christabel indignantly there was only one arthur the son of uther and Egern, who was born in the castle that stood on this very cliff on the first night of the year and carried away in secret by merlin and reared in secret by sir anton's wife the brave good arthur the christian king who was killed at the battle of camlin near slaughter bridge and was buried at gladstonbury and embalmed by tennyson the laureate invented arthur he took out a patent for the round table and his invention is only a little less popular than that other product of the age the sewing machine how many among modern tourists would care about tintagel if tennyson had not revived the old legend the butler had put up a bottle of champagne for mr hamley the two ladies drinking nothing but sparkling water and in this beverage he drank hail to the spirit of the legendary prince i am ready to believe anything now you have me up here he said for i have a shrewd idea that without your help i should never be able to get down again i should live and die on the top of this rocky promontory sweltering in the summer sun buffeted by the winter winds and unwilling simian stylites do you know that the very finest sheep in cornwall are said to be grown on that island said miss bridgman gravely pointing to the grassy top of the isolated crack in the foreground whereon once stood the dungeon keep i don't know why it should be so but it is a tradition among butchers said angus i suppose even butchers have their traditions and the poor sheep who are condemned to exile on that lonely rock the saint helena of their woolly race do they know that they are achieving a posthumous perfection that they are straining towards the ideal in butcher's meat there is room for much thought in the question the tide is out said christabel looking seaward i think we ought to do trebarwith sands to-day is trebarwith another of your lions asked angus placidly yes then please save him for to-morrow let me drink the cup of pleasure to the dregs where we are this champagne has a magical taste like the filter which tristan and isoult were so foolish as to drink while they sailed across from ireland to this cornish shore don't be alarmed miss bridgman i am not going to empty the bottle i am not an educated tourist have read neither black nor murray and i am very slow about taking in ideas even after all you have told me i am not clear in my mind as to which is the castle and which the chapel and which the burial ground let us finish the afternoon dawdling about tintagel let us see the sun set from this spot where arthur must so often have watched it if the men of thirteen hundred years ago ever cared to watch the sun setting which i doubt they belong to the night-time of the world when civilization was dead in southern europe and was yet unborn in the west let us dawdle about till it is time to drive back to mount royal and then i shall carry away an impression i am very slow at taking impressions i think you want us to believe that you are stupid said christabel laughing at the earnestness with which he pleaded believe me no i should like you to think me ever so much better than i am please let us dawdle they dawdled accordingly strolling about upon the short sea-beaten grass so treacherous and slippery a surface in summer-time when fierce sol has been baking it they stumbled against the foundations of long vanished walls 
they speculated upon fragments of cyclopean masonry and talked a great deal about the traditions of the spot christabel who had all the old authorities leland carew and norden at her fingers ends was delighted to expound the departed glories of the british fortress she showed where the ancient dungeon keep had reared its stony walls upon that high terrible crag environed with the sea and how there had once been a drawbridge uniting yonder cliff with the buildings on the mainland now divorced as carew says by the downfallen steep cliffs on the farther side which though it shut out the sea from his wonted recourse hath yet more strengthened the island for in passing thither you must first descend with a dangerous declining and then make a worse ascent by a path through his stickleness occasioning and through his steepness threatening the ruin of your life with the falling of your foot she told mr hamley how after the conquest the castle was the occasional residence of some of our princes and how richard king of the romans earl of cornwall son of king john entertained here his nephew david prince of wales how in richard the second's time this stronghold was made a state prison and how a certain lord mayor of london was for his unruly mayoralty condemned thither as a perpetual penitentiary which seems very hard upon the chief magistrate of the city who thus did vicarious penance for the riot of his brief reign and then they talked of tristan and isult and the tender old love story which lends the glamour of old-world fancies to those bare ruins of a traditional past christabel knew the old chronicle through matthew arnold's poetical version which gives only the pure and better side of the character of the knight and chatelaine at the expense of some of the strongest features of the story who that knew that romantic legend could linger on that spot without thinking of king mark's faithless queen assuredly not mr hamley who was a staunch believer in the inventor of sweetness and light and who knew arnold's verses by heart what have they done with the flowers and the terrace walks he said the garden where tristan and his queen basked in the sunshine of their days and where they parted for ever all the springtime of their love is already gone and past and instead thereof is seen its winter which endureth still tintagel on its surge beat hill the pleasance walks the weeping queen the flying leaves the straining blast and that long wild kiss their last End of quote. and where oh where are those graves in the king's chapel in which the tyrant mark touched with pity ordered the faded lovers to be buried and behold out of the grave of tristan there sprung a plant which went along the walls and descended into the grave of the queen and though king mark three several times ordered this magical creeper to be cut off root and branch it was always found growing again next morning as if it were the very spirit of the dead knight struggling to get free from the grave and to be with his lady love again show me those tombs miss courtenay you can take your choice said jessie bridgman pointing to a green mound or two overgrown with long rank grass in that part of the hill which was said to be the kingly burial-place but as for your magical tree there is not so much as a bramble to do duty for poor tristan if i were duke of cornwall and lord of tintagel castle i would put up a granite cross in memory of the lovers though i fear there was very little christianity in either of them said angus and i would come once a year and hang a garland on it said christabel smiling at him with quote, eyes of deep soft loosened hue eyes too expressive to be blue too lovely to be grey he had recalled those lines more than once when he looked into christabel's eyes mr hamley had read so much as to make him an interesting talker upon any subject but christabel and jessie noticed that of his own life his ways and amusements his friends his surroundings he spoke hardly at all this fact christabel noticed with wonder jessie with suspicion if a man led a good wholesome life he would surely be more frank and open he would surely have more to say about himself and his associates they dawdled and dawdled till past four o'clock and to none of the three did the hours so spent seem long but they found that it would make them too late in their return to mount royal were they to wait for sundown before they turned their faces homewards so while the day was still bright mr hamley consented to be guided by steep and perilous paths to the base of the rocky citadel and then they strolled back to the warncliffe arms where felix had been enjoying himself in the stable 
and was now desperately anxious to get home rattling up and down hill at an alarming rate and not hinting at anybody's alighting to walk this was only one of many days spent in the same fashion they walked next day to trebarwith sands up and down hills which mr hamley declared were steeper than anything he had ever seen in switzerland but he survived the walk and his spirits seemed to rise with the exertion this time major brie went with them a capital companion for a country ramble being just enough of a botanist archaeologist and geologist to leaven the lump of other people's ignorance without being obnoxiously scientific mr hamley was delighted with that noble stretch of level sand with the long rollers of the atlantic tumbling in across the low rocks and the bold headlands behind spot beloved of marine painters spot where the gulls and the shags hold their revels and where man feels himself but a poor creature face to face with the lonely grandeur of sea and cliff and sky so rarely is that long stretch of yellow sand vulgarized by the feet of earth's multitudes that one half expects to see a procession of frolicsome sea nymphs come dancing out of yonder cave and wind in circling measures towards the crested wavelets gliding in so softly under the calm clear day these were halcyon days an indian summer balmy western zephyrs sunny noontides splendid sunsets altogether the most beautiful autumn season that angus hamley had known or at least so it seemed to him nay even more than this surely the most beautiful season of his life as the days went on and day after day was spent in christabel's company almost as it were alone with her for miss bridgman and major pree were but as figures in the background angus felt as if he were at the beginning of a new life a life filled with fresh interests thoughts hopes desires unknown and undreamed of in the former stages of his being never before had he lived a life so uneventful never before had he been so happy it surprised him to discover how simple are the elements of real content how deep the charm of a placid existence among thoroughly lovable people christabel courtenay was not the loveliest woman he had ever known nor the most elegant nor the most accomplished nor the most fascinating but she was entirely different from all other women with whom his lot had been cast her innocence her unsophisticated enjoyment of all earth's purest joys her transparent purity her perfect trustfulness these were to him as a revelation of a new order of beings if he had been told of such a woman he would have shrugged his shoulders misbelievingly or would have declared that she must be an idiot but christabel was quite as clever as those brilliant creatures whose easy manners had enchanted him in days gone by she was better educated than many a woman he knew who passed for a wit of the first order she had read more thought more was more sympathetic more companionable and she was delightfully free from self-consciousness or vanity he found himself talking to christabel as he had never talked to any one else since those early days at the university the bright dawn of manhood when he confided freely in that second self the chosen friend of the hour and believed that all men lived and moved according to his own boyish standard of honour he talked to her not of the actualities of his life but of his thoughts and feelings his dreamy speculations upon the gravest problems which hedge round the secret of man's final destiny he talked freely of his doubts and difficulties and the half-belief which came so near unbelief the wide love of all creation the vague yet passionate yearning for immortality which fell so far short of the gospel's sublime certainty he revealed to her all the complexities of a many-sided mind and she never failed him in sympathy and understanding this was in their graver moods when by some accidental turn of the conversation they fell into the discussion of those solemn questions which are always at the bottom of every man and woman's thoughts like the unknown depths of a dark water-pool for the most part their talk was bright and light as those sunny autumn days varied as the glorious and ever-changing hues of sky and sea at sunset jessie was a delightful companion she was so thoroughly easy herself that it was impossible to feel ill at ease with her she played her part of confidant so pleasantly seeming to think it the most natural thing in the world that those two should be absorbed in each other and should occasionally lapse into complete forgetfulness of her existence major brie when he joined in their rambles was obviously devoted to jessie bridgman it was her neatly gloved little hand which he was eager to clasp at the crossing of his style 
and where the steepness of the hillside path gave him an excuse for assisting her it was her stout little boot which he guided so tenderly where the ways were ruggedest never had a plain woman a more respectful admirer never was beauty in her peerless zenith more devoutly worshipped and so the autumn days sped by pleasantly for all with deepest joy joy ever waxing never waning for those two who had found the secret of perfect sympathy in thought and feeling it was not for angus hamley the first passion of a spotless manhood and yet the glamour and the delight were as new as if he had never loved before he had never so purely so reverently loved the passion was of a new quality it seemed to him as if he had ascended into a higher sphere in the universe and had given his heart to a creature of a loftier race perhaps it is the good old lineage which makes the difference he said to himself once while his feelings were still sufficiently novel and so far under his control as to the subject to analysis the women i have cared for in days gone by have hardly got over their early affinity with the gutter or when i have admired a woman of good family she has been steeped to the lips in worldliness and vanity mr hamley who had told himself that he was going to be intensely bored at mount royal had been mrs tregonell's guest for three weeks and it seemed to him as if the time were brief and beautiful as one of those rare dreams of impossible bliss which haunt our waking memories and make actual life dull and joyless by contrast with the glory of shadowland no word had yet been spoken nay at the very thought of those words which most lovers in his position would have been eager to speak his soul sickened and his cheek paled for there would be no joyfulness in the revelation of his love indeed he doubted whether he had the right to reveal it whether duty and honour did not alike constrain him to keep his converse within the strict limits of friendship to bid christabel good-bye and turn his back upon mount royal without having said one word more than a friend might speak happy as christabel had been with him tenderly as she loved him she was far too innocent to have considered herself ill-treated in such a case she would have blamed herself alone for the weakness of mind which had been unable to resist the fascination of his society she would have blushed and wept in secret for her folly in having loved unwooed has the eventful question been asked jessie inquired one night as christabel lingered after her wont by the fire in miss bridgman's bedroom you too were so intensely earnest to-day as you walked ahead of the major and me that i had said to myself now is the time the crisis has arrived there was no crisis answered christabel crimsoning he has never said one word to me that can imply that i am any more to him than the most indifferent acquaintance what need of words when every look and tone cries i love you why he idolizes you and he lets all the world see it i hope it may be well for you both christabel was on her knees by the fire she laid her cheek against jessie's waistband and drew jessie's arm around her neck holding her hand lovingly do you really think he cares for me she faltered with her face hidden do i really think that i have two eyes and something which is at least an apology for a nose ejaculated jessie contemptuously why it has been patent to everybody for the last fortnight that you two are over head and ears in love with each other there never was a more obvious case of mutual infatuation oh jessie surely i have not betrayed myself i know that i have been very weak but i have tried so hard to hide and have been about as successful as the ostrich while those drooping lashes have been lowered to hide the love-light in your eyes your whole countenance has been an illuminated calendar of your folly poor bell to think that she has not betrayed herself while all Castle is on tiptoe to know when the wedding is to take place why the parson could not see you two sitting in the same pew without knowing that he would be reading your bands before he was many sundays older and you you really like him faltered christabel more shyly than before yes answered jessie with a provoking lack of enthusiasm i really like him i can't help feeling sorry for mrs tregonell for i know she wanted you to marry leonard christabel gave a little sigh and a faint shiver poor dear leonard i wonder what traveller's hardships he is enduring while we are so snug and happy at mount royal she said kindly he has an excellent heart troublesome people always have i believe interjected jessie it is their redeeming feature the existence of which no one can absolutely disprove 
and i am very much attached to him as a cousin or as an adopted brother but as to our ever being married that is quite out of the question there never were two people less suited to each other those are the people who usually come together said jessie the divorce court could hardly be kept going if it were not so jessie if you are going to be cynical i shall say good-night i hope there is no foundation for what you said just now i hope that auntie has no foolish idea about leonard and me she has or had one prevailing idea and i fear it will go hard with her when she has to relinquish it answered jessie seriously i know that it has been her dearest hope to see you and leonard married and i should be a wretch if i were not sorry for her disappointment when she has been so good to me but she never ought to have invited mr hamley to mount royal that is one of those mistakes the consequences of which last for a lifetime i hope he likes me just a little pursued christabel with dreamy eyes fixed on the low wood fire but sometimes i fancy there must be some mistake that he does not really care a straw for me more than once when he has began to say something that sounded business-like suggested jessie as the girl hesitated he has drawn back seeming almost anxious to recall his words once he told me quite seriously that he had made up his mind never to marry now that doesn't sound as if he meant to marry me that is not an uncommon way of breaking ground answered jessie with her matter-of-fact air a man tells a girl that he is going to die a bachelor which makes it seem quite a favour on his part when he proposes all women sigh for the unattainable and a man who distinctly states that he is not in the market is likely to make a better bargain when he surrenders i should be sorry to think mr hamley capable of such petty ideas said christabel he told me once that he was like achilles why should he be like achilles he is not a soldier perhaps it is because he has a grecian nose suggested miss bridgman how can you imagine him so vain and foolish cried christabel deeply offended i begin to think you detest him no bell i think him charming only too charming and i had rather the man you loved were made of sterner metal not such a man as leonard whose loftiest desires are centred in stable and gun-room but a man of an altogether different type from mr hamley he has too much of the artistic temperament without being an artist he is too versatile too soft-hearted and impressionable i am afraid for you christabel i am afraid and if it were not too late if your heart were not wholly given to him it is answered christabel tearfully with her face hidden i hate myself for being so foolish but i have let myself love him i know that i may never be his wife i do not even think that he has any idea of marrying me but i shall never marry any other man oh jessie for pity's sake don't betray me never let my aunt or any one else in the world learn what i have told you i can't help trusting you you wind yourself into my heart somehow and find out all that is hidden there because i love you truly and honestly my dear answered jessie tenderly and now good night i feel sure that mr hamley will ask you to be his wife and i only wish he were a better man End of chapter three